Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We ask you to work in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, over the, the subjects that we have today through Hebrews 11, that it would strengthen our faith. And I thank you so much, Lord, if your word says, whether it's a town, a battle, an event, or the fact that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm so grateful, Lord, over time we're able to confirm more and more your word is truth. And today is a great day for that also. So open your word to every heart that's here, every heart that's listening. And strengthen us, Lord, for the week ahead, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, faith, yes, we're still in chapter 11, is the substance, the basis of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, we've been told that they crossed the Red Sea, and today, yes, I'll show you photos of the things they've actually found in the Red Sea, chariot wheels, bones, and other things as well. So we'll get into some of that, but also verse 2, for by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen, perhaps even your own body, were not made of things which do appear. The things which are seen are made by things that they, at the time the author wrote it, could not see, whether it's at the molecular level, the atomic level, the particle level. But along those lines, an article came out this last week that I thought was really actually important. So you're going to bear with me. I'm going to read it to you. And uh, actually, guys in the back, I did find it. So here I can pull it up for you, hopefully. This is coming from news.com.au, an Australian website. The title is, it's from May, uh, May, 25th, 28, May 29th, 2018. How many of you uh, really kind of fell asleep all the time in chemistry class, bio class? Okay, I'll lose a few of you, but the rest of you, hopefully, I'll do my best to keep this simple. Title, did the overwhelming, why did the overwhelming majority of species in existence today emerge about the same time? Let me explain. Suddenly, everything showed up. <laughs> Who would have suspected that a handheld genetic test used to unmask sushi bars? <laughs> I'm just reading what it says. Look, I mean, right here, see? Look, there you go. Used to unmask sushi bars, pawning off tilapia for tuna, could have delivered deep insights into evolution, including how new species emerge. And who would have thought that to trawl through five million of these gene snapshots called DNA barcodes, collected from 100,000 animal species by hundreds of researchers around the world and deposited in the US government-run GenBank database, who would think that they would trawl through them? Well, that would be Mark Stockel from the Rockefeller University in New York and David Thaler at the University of Basel in Switzerland, who together published findings last week sure to jostle, if not overturn, more than one settled idea about how evolution unfolds. It's, it is textbook biology, for example, that species with large, far-flung populations, think ants, rats, humans, will become more genetically diverse over time. But is that true? The answer is no, said Stockel, lead author of the study published in the Journal of Human Evolution. For the planet's 7.6 billion people, 500 million house sparrows, or 100,000 sandpipers, genetic diversity is about the same, he told the AFP. Today's most startling result, perhaps, is that nine out of 10 species on Earth today, including humans, came into being about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Gee, that's so close. I mean, how could you? 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Now, how many remember this from science class where they showed you, for example, crocodilians. You and I know them as crocodiles. Thank you. Birds, you know as birds. Thank you. And the idea is that these different animals or species have their lines and they reproduce after their own kind. See, this, the yellow lines are what we actually find living or even in the fossil record. Everybody's still with me. The really, really stinking hopeful theory of evolution is that somehow all those yellow lines are connected by these transitional forms that mutated from an ancient ancestor that crawled out of ooze and mutated, 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 and became the basis through which all these other lines have been formed. Everybody still with me? Does everybody remember this from class? These are called different trees, genetic trees. The problem is the yellow is what we find and observe, and the problem for them is that the blue-gray here at the bottom is what they hope they could find, but has yet to emerge. 
Well, guess what this research showed? Nine out of 10 species on Earth today, including humans, came into being in their line 100,000, 200,000 years ago. Yeah, but Pastor Chris, that's not what, they used to say that about mitochondrial DNA in women. They kept studying it. Now that number's down to 6,000 to 6,500 years ago that that suddenly appeared. So just give them time. They'll catch up to your Bible, but at least they're moving in the right direction. <laughs> this conclusion is very surprising. Listen to this. This conclusion is very surprising that everything started showing up. And I fought against it as hard as I could, Fowler said. That reaction is understandable. How does one explain the fact that 90% of animal life, genetically speaking, is roughly the same age? That means these little wishful trees in different eras, here's 2.3 million, 144 million years ago, that means this doesn't work. It's <laughs> pointing it out. Was there some catastrophic event 200,000 years ago that nearly wiped the slate clean? How about a 4,000 years ago? To answer the question, one has to understand DNA barcoding. Animals have two kinds of DNA. The one we're most familiar with, nuclear DNA, is passed down in most animals, that would include you, by male and female parents, and contains a genetic blueprint for each animal. The genome, made up of DNA, is constructed of four types of molecules arranged in pairs. In humans, there are three billion of these pairs grouped into about 20,000 genes. But all animals have DNA in their mitochondria, which, they, which are tiny structures inside each cell that convert energy from food into a form that cells can use. Mitochondria contain 37 genes, and one of them, known as COI, is used to do DNA barcoding. Unlike the genes in nuclear DNA, which can differ greatly from species to species, all animals have the same set of mitochondrial DNA, providing a common basis for comparison. Mitochondrial DNA is also a lot simpler and cheaper to isolate. Around 2002, uh, Canadian molecular biologist Paul Hebert, who coined the term DNA barcode, figured out a way to identify species by analyzing the COI gene. The mitochondrial sequence has proven perfect for this all-animal approach because it is just the right balance of two conflicting properties, said Fowler. On the one hand, COI gene sequence is similar across all animals, make it easy to pick out and compare. On the other hand, these mitochondrial snippets are different enough to be able to distinguish between each species, each yellow line. It coincides almost perfectly with the species des designations made by specialist experts in each animal domain, Thaler said. In analyzing the barcodes across 100,000 species, the researchers found a telltale sign showing that almost all the animals emerged about the same time as humans. That's not what they've been telling us. That's not how the theory worked. What they saw was a lack of variation in the so-called neutral mutations, which are slight changes in DNA across generations that neither help nor hurt an individual's chances of survival. In other words, they were irrelevant in terms of the natural and sexual drivers of evolution. How similar or not these neutral mutations are each to each other is like tree rings as they reveal the approximate age of a species. Which brings us back to our question. Why did the overwhelming majority of species in existence today emerge at about the same time? Next section says, and I'll show it to you because you think I'll make this up. Darwin perplexed. <laughs> Environmental trauma is one possibility, explained Jesse Osubel, director of the program for human environment at Rockefeller University. Viruses, ice ages, successful new competitors, loss of prey, all these may cause periods when the population of an animal drops sharply. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about them emerging suddenly. Well, that was a nice try, he told, commenting. Further down, in these periods, it is easier for genetic innovation to sweep the population and contribute to the emergence of a new species. But the last mass extinction event was 65 million years ago, when likely an asteroid wiped out the land-bound dinosaurs. And the proof is? Thank you. And half of all species on Earth. This means a population bottleneck is only a partial explanation at best. 
The simplest interpretation is that life is always evolving. Uh, wait a second, but the crocodiles that we have now look a lot like the crocodiles they found way back here, they claim. And the horseshoe crabs that we step on in New Jersey now look a lot like the horseshoe crabs they find in layers supposed to be millions of years old. And the coelacanth that's supposed to be 70 million years old until some in Indonesia pulled it into a fishing boat looks remarkably the same as the one that they claim was 70 million years ago. So that line doesn't fit what we, never mind, it doesn't fit what we find. Life is always evolving, said Stockel. It's more likely that at all times in evolution, animals alive at that point arose relatively recently, except for the crocodiles and horseshoe crabs and a whole bunch of other things. In this view, a species only lasts a certain amount of time before it either evolves into something new or goes extinct. We can prove that wrong with our own fossil record. And yet, now here's the payoff. Another unexpected finding from the study, species have very clear genetic Boundaries, they stay in their yellow lines. They don't cross. That is the payoff. Species have very clear genetic boundaries. Listen to this, and there's nothing much in between. How about individuals? If individuals are stars, birds, crocodiles, whatever, then the species are galaxies, clusters of them, said Thaler. They are compact clusters in the vastness of empty sequence space. What do you mean? The absence of in-between species is something also that perplexed Darwin. Let me make it simple. Transitional forms. They don't find evidence genetically, which means what they find is everything's reproducing after its own kind. The more they research, the more our technology improves, the more they're going to prove that God created the heavens and the earth. Just hang in there and be patient. But we're in Hebrews. I just, I had to read that to you. I'm sorry. That was, I saw it and I, we've got to share that. We'll see it again if we get back to Genesis before the Lord returns. At this rate, we may not. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By the way, just a reminder, by faith, Noah, being warned of, God's of things not, warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark, where suddenly all the genetic information bottlenecked. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So verse 22, 23, we pick up. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper or fair or good child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Okay, we're in the book of Hebrews. What's one of the problems these Hebrew readers are having? They're afraid of persecution, and so they're turning from the gospel of Jesus to go back to their Judaism. So now as we get into Hebrews 11, you're going to note a theme of this is what the law said, but this is what faith does. So let's see how that plays out. They hid Moses for three months because he was a proper child. Turn to Exodus 2. Again, we need to review. For those who go to synagogue every week, it would be fresh. But for you and I, we've got to catch up. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 1, Exodus. Then when a man of the house of Levi took a wife of the daughter of Levi... And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, verse 2, she hid him three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and pitch so it will float. She put the child therein and she laid him in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister Miriam stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Remember, Pharaoh had decreed all male children to be thrown into the Nile to be killed. We covered that last week. And the daughters of Pharaoh came down, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And the maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she, and my assumption is it's Pharaoh's daughter, but we'll find out one day for sure, when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. Here this little basket comes. Moe's in there having a hand sandwich and playing with his toes. He's as happy as can be, right? Just rocking back and forth. She pulls the lid off. <gasps> Lip quavers. Tears fly. Little guy starts crying. Ladies, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's like, 
The hands go right down to pick up that little middle. Like, what's the matter, buddy? It's a good thing it wasn't a man. No, seriously. An Egyptian man with that decree might have gone and dropped them. They say, I love this comment from one theologian, big doors turn on little hinges. And that little hinge is that little guy started crying. You know, and that lady went, oh, you know, and she picked him up and, he's, and she's patting his little, you know, little powders coming out from under his cheeks there in his little diaper. And he's, he starts calming down, you know, and, and ladies, when you were little, you had dolls. You nursed them, you changed them, you bathed them, you took care of them, you scolded them, you put them in bed, you rose them up, you carted them all around and all that. And you grew up one day and hopefully by the grace of God, you might have had the opportunity to be a mom. Guys, when you were little, you wore capes, you flew, you saved things, you, you were police officers, you were whatever, and you grew up and you got a job. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she picked him up. She's staring at the little guy. Poor little guy, he's so sad. She's trying to cheer him up. While this is happening, the daughter of Pharaoh holding on to him, Miriam, his sister, verse 7, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse of the Hebrew women that he may nurse the child? I mean, she can't buy formula. She's got to do something. Can I get you a wet nurse? Yeah, please do. And Pharaoh's daughter said, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me. And I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew. She brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She weaned him, which could be anywhere from three to four years of age. Because, again, they, that culture, that's, that's what they did. Many times to invest in his heart the truth of the true and living God. How do I know? Whitney's three, and she knows Jesus. She talks about him all the time. Loves to sing hymns and all that. The child grew. She brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called his name Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out and unto his brethren. What does that mean? He went out unto his brethren. What does that mean? What does he know? He spied an Egyptian. He went out to look on their burdens. He spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way, and he looked that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as thou killedst the Egyptian? Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and sat down by a well. On your way back, stop at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Stephen is before the Sanhedrin in giving his defense. He also comments on this event. And he says this in verse 18. And by the way, good thing to know, verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, that his children would leave that land after the fourth generation... People grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast their young children out unto the end that they might not live. Verse 20, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, that's when he grew up. Parents, cheer up. <laughs> he came, came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed, this is interesting, that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they were striving, and he would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you wrong one the other? And he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Will you kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And so Moses fled. Okay, so back to Hebrews. Moses, somehow, in observing what was going on and knowing what was shared to them about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
and I'm sure it was shared with him as a small child, and he would hear about it later too, that God would take those descendants down in the fourth generation, bring them out, and that through Abraham's seed, God would send a blessing to all the earth. So Moses, by faith, verse 24, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He gave up his privilege, apparently. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Now, in some form, whether he decided he denounced that relationship, we don't have the particulars. He began to be among the, the, the Hebrews and labor with them. We don't know. There's lots of ideas about it. But in some way, he made it clear that his lot was with the people of God and not with the Egyptians who had fostered him all those years. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Again, the Hebrew readers should note that rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We've got to stop there for a minute. Sin is pleasurable. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be tempting. How many of you are tempted on Monday to get a root canal? <laughs> no offense to any endodontists that may be here listening. How many of you are tempted to go have a knee replacement done? The reason you do it is you can't take it anymore. How many of you are tempted to go out, and put your head under a truck tire, and see what happens if it rolls forward? None of those things are tempting to you. Why? Because they're not pleasurable. It's funny how little they tempt you. But sin is pleasurable. And that's why it's the temptation that it is. Interestingly enough, one of the big things that are taking our country down is the sin of pornography. And it's not just men, it's women. And of course, what does that give rise to? Well, that awakens all kinds of stuff, so it goes into more and more corrupt forms. Or because of this internet age and the generation we have now, now there are many adultery websites out there that will gladly give you what they call as an anonymous login and, and you know, profile, which of course can be hacked, and several have been hacked in the past, where you can now connect with people in your local area who all understand we're here for the affair, this is nothing but sex, there is no relationship, so don't even think about it, this is just purely for pleasure. I don't tell my spouse. You don't tell your spouse. We don't tell anybody. And the internet brings us together and we go our separate ways. Nobody would ever know. Nobody would ever be hurt. And guess what I've watched? I have watched God in his sovereignty expose these kind of things in ways that you would, it defies your imagination, how God gets the truth out. It often starts with a spouse saying, something's wrong. I just know something's wrong. And then what do you know? In the course of just going through the life, boom, the information gets out, everything blows up, now it's a problem, now they're sitting in my office, now we're going back and forth. I got asked a very interesting question by someone recently of the marriages that have gotten in, and whether it's the wife or the husband, I see both, get caught in an affair. Do you see those marriages get healed or do you see them fail? And after sitting there and thinking about it for a minute, thankfully I can say I've actually seen within our confines, our confines of, of the folks here, I've seen the majority of them get healed which for me was, I, I never really stopped to consider. I'm actually grateful I did because that helps me go, all right, I'll meet with you. Instead of, why am I sitting here? This isn't going to get healed anyway, so what's the point? So at least it's an encouragement not to give up. When it all comes out, and it does, we do the sort of the post-mortem on what happened. I asked the person that got caught up, was it worth it? What do you think I've heard every single time? No. Sin is pleasurable for a season. There's a place God desired you to enjoy intimate pleasure. It is between you and your husband or you and your wife. It is a gift for your wedding night. It is to be enjoyed till death do you part. And if it's getting to be a problem, they can help you. That's where it's meant to be enjoyed, used, and that's what it was created for, to be the glue between a man and a woman for marriage, to be the joy that they share. Anything other than that? comes under God's judgment, but it's still pleasurable. Heroin use, pleasurable, euphoric, until you get a bad batch that gives you a massive allergic reaction or you have a massive overdose to it and you're suddenly gone. Alcohol, it's pleasurable until you consume so much your liver finally says, I'm done, checks out, or you cause yourself harm in some event. Gambling, pleasurable till you're bankrupt. Lots of things, pleasurable, until it wipes you out. 
And the problem is you get so locked into that sin, you can't see you're destroying yourself. Everybody else around you can see it. And they're all going, oh, you do it. and they don't, you don't want to hear it. And they're all trying to tell you you're out of control, bridge out, off you go. And you don't want to hear it until you crash. Why? Because it's pleasurable. But it only lasts for a season. It only lasts for a season. Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of the royal court in Egypt for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, Hebrew readers, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. What do you mean? These all died in faith, looking forward to the promise that God would save them. We die looking back. We know his name, Jesus of Nazareth. But he was looking in faith. The reproach of Christ was greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense or the wages of that reward that would last forever instead of some temporary gain. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Again, Hebrew readers. For he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. We've been through it recently Tuesday morning in Exodus. You can go back and listen on, online on the app. They had to take a lamb. They had to kill the lamb. They had to collect the blood. And that wasn't enough. Once they collected the blood, what did they have to do? They had to apply it. Not enough to have the blood. You had to go out and apply it to the doorposts and the lintels of the house. A type of Christ. Not a bone of it shall be broken. You must apply the blood for death to pass over. They had to eat of it. They had to bring inside the idea of our idea of faith. You had to bring inside. You had to eat of it. You had to apply it. And then death would pass over. Interesting, too. That's what that June 20th with David Brickner, Jews for Jesus, that's going to be showing you the types of Christ in the Passover. Not enough just to have the blood. You've got to apply it. Not, no bone can be broken. Neither was Jesus's. You had to, if they couldn't finish the whole lamb, it had to be burned and consumed in a fire by morning so that none would be left over. Why? Because you will not let my soul stay in Sheol, neither will you let your Holy One see corruption. It is not allowed to decay. Why? Because our ultimate Passover lamb will rise again the third day. He will not decay. Many, many types in the Passover that Moses did by faith. And guess what? Death passed over through the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Now I've been promising you for weeks, shamelessly, chariot wheels. So now that we've gotten past our whole dinosaur thing, Let's move on to this. The children of Israel, and you can again dim the lights up front here, gentlemen, I'll be fine. The children of Israel left Goshen, Ramesses, and they came first to Sukkoth. And they moved from Sukkoth and they came to Etam. You can look it up and read it for yourself. Then they were changed in direction by God, lest they go up here and see warfare. He sent them down to this area of Nueva, which is also called Pihahiroth. You try it. Pihahiroth. Yeah, very good. Can you see this light circle here above my arrow? That is a beach. Here is a crossing point. And then that brought him over here into the land of Midian, which you and I know as Arabia. It is down here. And today, you can see it by Google Earth, in Arabia, there's a place called Jebel al Laws. That is the mountain of the laws. Basically, it is here that there is a mountain that has granite that is burned black with fire. The mountain top as God did during the Ten Commandments, Exodus 19 and 20. But we're not here for that today, so let's keep going. So here is again that beach. Everybody see it? We're zooming in. Here is the path along what we call in Egypt the Sinai Peninsula, which that's what it's called, but you'll see. Here is the path that leads to that beach. Everybody still with me? How many have I lost? Can you see this? Can you see the mouse here? Good. Okay, so this guy, if you were to stand here, and turn around, this is what you would see. That is this mountain opening here from the edge of the beach. Now, there's two things this does. Number one, the high ridges keep the Egyptians out. That's a plus. Number two, it traps the Israelis in. That's a negative. 
Here is an aerial view of that beach again. Here's that opening right here that I was showing you. If you can see it down here in the bottom picture, that is where you would come out, come out here, turn around, and this is what you see. According to those who have seen this area, this is more than large enough to handle 2 to 2.4 million people on a beach. Okay, but let's get to what I told you about. Here, interestingly enough, right at our beach, the Weba Beach, there is a sub, sub, it's called a submarine bridge, basically, but oh, there's a bridge underwater. And what it has for us is on this side, it is about 500 meters deep. This side, about 300 meters deep. Here, it is only 33 meters deep or 108 feet. Here again is our beach where everybody could hang out. That bridge going across is a half mile wide, eight miles long. It'll go across the Red Sea. Again, this side more than 500 meters deep, this side more than 300, this about 108 feet deep. This is where God would remove or blow with the winds the water off and the walls of water would rise up. It is also along this area that Ron Wyatt was the first to do this, I believe first in the late 80s. Ron Wyatt went down to go see what's there. When he went down, he found three chariot wheels covered with gold, three that had gold as well as others covered with barnacles. Three of them. Here is one. See the gold edge? Okay. And the barnacle on the hub. He also found down there the bodies of chariots, or the, the chassis, human bones, horse bones, and wheels. Saudi, on the Saudi Arabian side, going across eight miles over, they also did some diving and found things there also. So here they are, these golden chariot wheels. The problem is, Coral, they say, will not grow in the gold, but the wood that is inside the gold, of which it's overlaid, has completely deteriorated, so to move these will basically be to destroy them. So they photographed them, and they left them. Here are wheels that must not have had gold covering or eroded off, because here the barnacles have taken over. That's a wheel, that's the axle hub. Here's a wheel, here's the axle shaft, here's the other wheel. That chariot went on its side, okay? Here again, another of these three wheels that they found, with barnacles getting on this side, where it's deteriorated. They would hope that later they would send many subs on either side into the greater depths and see what's there also. I don't know if that's happened. This is artwork from the time of the Exodus, about 1440 BC, and there are chariot wheels at that time, and their artwork were four-spoked wheels. What did they find? Four-spoked wheels, as well as, I think, some others, but this was the period, these were the hubcaps on the cars of that year, put it in modern English. Again, a wheel here, here's a hub, barnacles, wheel here, here's a hub. These are the things that they found. Here's the idea. Here's the axle, the wheel hub, and the shaft. And this is what it looks like when the barnacles move in and grow all over it. They found human bones. They found horse bones. Here is a horse's hoof. After it came out and dried out, it had shrunken. But they found them. These things are sitting underneath the, beach, underneath the ocean on this little stretch that is just the right depth compared to the other two sides and a half mile wide and eight miles long to take people out of that beach and into the land of Midian. One more thing was found. Ron Wyatt found originally on this beach a column, but it was smooth, nothing written on it. He got eventually into the Saudi Arabian side, found the other column on the other side. That other column had on it in Phoenician letters several things, Mizraim, which is Egypt, Solomon, Edom, death, Pharaoh, Moses, Yahweh, indicating King Solomon had set up these columns as a memorial to the miracle crossing of the sea. Solomon reigned about 480 years roughly after they had left Egypt or after they had come into the land. So about 500 years, Solomon set up these memorial posts or memorial posts to commemorate this crossing at that beach going across the Red Sea where we've div men have gone in and found the chariot wheels. By the way, when the Saudis found out they had this, they took it down, and they have left a cap on the ground, a concrete lid, basically, like a tank lid with a flag simply marking that an archaeological find was there. Just like they have a fence around that mountain that's burned with fire right here, and it is patrolled. These things are there. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. But Pastor Chris, Snopes said it didn't happen. Because I've shared this, and I've had people email me, like, Pastor, Snopes said it didn't happen. Snopes has a big red false. See a nice red yeah. there? They said false. Their take on this was, and I'll just briefly sum up. They said according to a World News Daily report, WNDR, they claim from uh, October 2014, 
They said essentially, despite WNDR's framing of the alleged discovery as recent and newly announced, reports of divers finding chariot wheels and the like under the Red Sea are a hoax that has been promulgated for many years now. Okay, that's fine. The problem we have is that we've got multiple sources that have confirmed that they're there, including this great book I encourage you for your library to buy, Leonard Moeller's The Exodus Case. Moeller has confirmed they're there. Wyatt found them, confirmed that they were there. There are several other teams also that have supposedly confirmed that these things are there. We've got multiple sources that have said these things are there. Now, since we're talking about Snopes, this is from another news site, World Net Daily. It was interesting because it came out on uh, April 25th, 2018, caught my attention. Activists confess Bible ban does target faith community. Let me get to the point. Snopes, uh, in what could be a huge embarrassment for the online fact checker Snopes, both a lawmaker and an LGBT activist have admitted a California state bill targets pastors and members of the faith community who insist a man is a man, not a woman, and vice versa. Further down, Snopes admits the bill relates to gay conversion therapy, but states that the legislation does not mention the Bible, Christianity, or religion at all. But now, in a new video, reveal, a new video has revealed California State Assembly member Al Muratshushi admitting that he wants to target people of faith. Further down in the article, this came from sources playing with, oh sorry, Snopes is playing with words, contends longtime professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, Robert Gagnon, author of the Bible and homosexual practice. His column at the Federalist was titled, Snopes is a sneaky liar about California's bill to ban Christian LGBT talk. He said, quote, if you haven't already lost significant respect for Snopes as an impartial fact checker, its analysis of a bill that bans all transactions involved stating Christian beliefs about homosexual behavior, it should, he said. Further down, he talks about the bill passed. That bill passed 50 to 18 on April 19th is being considered in the state Senate. Snopes' insistence that California Assembly Bill 2943 would not result in the Bible being banned in California is akin to Snopes calling demonstrably and clearly false the claim that Joseph Stalin killed everyone around him, wrote Gorgon. Indeed, so far as we know, he never personally killed anyone, Stalin. But he did have a great many people killed. Estimates include he was responsible for the deaths of 20 to 25 million people and sent many others to the gulag and generally terrorized both his own country and Eastern Europe for decades. This guy basically says, just because Snopes reports it doesn't mean it's accurate. So we got photos, we got evidence, we got physical evidence from down there. And now we have a great book that came out in the last 10 years, I think, that you can get for yourself. It's a great one for your library. They did leave, oh, Joshua. Oh, well. Well, you, what, what happened with Joshua? What happened to Jericho? Oh, the walls fell down. Well, if the walls fell down, what should we be able to find? Well, we'll get that next time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these things to encourage our faith. Lord, whether it's genetically, we're finding that things reproduce after their own kind. And they stay within their kinds. Sure, there's variation, but they're still all birds, they're still all apes, and they're still all humans. And we thank you, Lord, that again, major events that you have told us, a flood, we see evidence all around the world. We found the oceans under the crust. We find the seashells on the top of Mount Everest. And Lord, you told us your people crossed the Red Sea miraculously, and Pharaoh's army was drowned, and we found the parts how I pray for anyone listening that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they're willing to trust that if they will confess the Lord Jesus with their mouth, if they will confess with their heart, confess in their mouth that he's risen from the dead, they believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead, they'll be saved. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It is the same Bible that promises us salvation that we have confirmed over and over and over again in archaeology, in science, Lord, and in faith. Go with your people today, bless them this week, and thank you, Lord, you've given us enough evidence that you will leave every man, woman, and child without excuse one day before you. How I pray our hearts would be open. Go with us in Jesus' name.
Amen.